Hello and welcome to this fourth lecture um, in this series on atomic and molecular structure and spectroscopy. So in the last lecture we looked at LCAO, Linear Combination of Atomic Orbital Theory, and looked at how to derive and calculate molecular orbitals from a linear combination of atomic orbitals. In today's lecture we're going to look at some applications of LCAO theory. So LCAO theory basically works on the principle that if you have n atomic orbitals to start with, so last week, we, in the last session, we took two orbitals, so a, a 1s orbital on one hydrogen atom and a 1s orbital on another hydrogen atom, and we combined them to give two molecular orbitals, one bonding, one antibonding. So if you put n atomic orbitals in, you'll get n molecular orbitals out. If you've got lots of atomic orbitals, so if you start to think of um, polyelectronic um, atoms, so with lots of electrons in lots of atomic orbitals, basically the atomic orbitals can only interact if they first of all have the same symmetry. So, because if they didn't have the same symmetry, um, the overlap integral s would equal to zero. So when you try and take a linear combination, you end up with just the initial orbitals again. And also, we require the the interactions between the orbitals are larger if they are close in energy. So you can imagine two, orbit, two orbitals very far apart. So you can imagine I don't know a one s orbital with some electrons in and a three s orbital with some electrons in. They're very far apart, so they're not going to interact interact very with, with each other very strongly. And if you think of in terms of LCO theory, this is um, whoop, this is. HAB, so this 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 number, um, which is this integral, um, which we saw last time, HAB is is larger. So if you do it for a, an atom, say in the first in the first row of the periodic table, you take all the atomic orbitals for one atom. So this is atom, this is atom atom one, and you take atom two. You take the atomic orbitals, combine them, you get this lin you get these molecular orbitals in the middle. And then if you've got some electrons, you can just start to, to put them in and fill up as, as far as you need to go. So for example, oxygen is um, has eight electrons per atom. So I've put the 16 electrons into these molecular orbitals and you end up with these two parallel um, electrons in the pi star orbitals, which gives oxygen its paramagnetic character. So here we can see straight away that using LCO theory gives us molecular orbitals which can explain, start to explain things about the chemistry. And that's, that's the key thing about LCO theory and molecular orbitals. Of course, you'll remember from first year lectures that the order of these orbitals here um, varies as you go across the, the first row of the periodic table. So for later on, um, at the beginning of the, the row of the of the of the rows in the periodic table, you get this the ordering shown in the figure here. And then once you go between nitrogen and oxygen, the, this order switches round and gives the, the, the figure we just saw on the previous slide. Molecular orbital theory and linear LCAO theory can actually even explain this. What we've got is we could imagine that if we had a 2s orbital on this atom and a 2p orbital on this atom over here, so if you take a 2p orbital um, going along the, the intermolecular axis, we can imagine between this atom here and this atom here, there's going to be a bonding interaction. So you, this will push down this orbital here and push up the, the, one of the p orbitals. And the same thing will happen between an s orbital here and a p orbital whoop, this side shaded in, and p orbital over here. So this one gets pushed down and this one gets pushed up. And then when we form the atom the molecular orbitals from from these atomic orbitals we're already with this interaction in 
we get this revised order of molecular orbitals. So we can even explain things things like this, which um, which could other, could otherwise not be be explained. If you have heteronuclear diatomics, I should say, up till now we've just thought about homonuclear diatomics. Last le last lecture we thought about the H two molecule. This week we've, we've this session we've looked at diatomics, homonuclear diatomics of the first row of the periodic table. If you have heteronuclear diatomics, there are a couple of different things you need to consider. So the first is the relative energies of atomic orbitals. If the orbitals are very different in energy, then they're not going to interact. So this, this HAB term um, is going to be small, so it's going to lead, lead to very, um, very little interaction. We also need to think about the symmetry. So if the orbitals aren't of the correct symmetry, then they're not going to interact and the, ov and the overlap's going to be, be zero. So an example here is of the HF molecule. So this is the H atom on this side. This is the F atom here. So the interactions are going to be between the 1s orbitals on hydrogen and the 2p orbitals on fluorine, because these are the orbitals which are, are closest in energy. Here we can see we've got two, we've got one orbital here and three, three orbitals here, these are the atomic orbitals, so it gives us four molecular orbitals in the middle. We can see that two of the p orbitals haven't interacted, and this is because these are the, the ones of the wrong symmetry. So if we over here we have an s orbital like that, but on the p on over here we've got the p orbitals which won't interact are going to be the ones like this. the ones like this, so the ones where the p orbitals coming out of the plane of the screen. Because the overlap between these orbitals, these p orbitals, and the s orbital over here is going to be to be zero. The orbital which does interact is the p orbital which looks like this. So we can take um, an in phase combination, so this is going to be, this one is effectively this combination atomic orbitals and this one up here is the antibonding combination and then in these two in here are basically the other two p orbitals so if we were to do analysis of the um, the the LCO theory of this of this system we'd use the 1s orbital of um, of hydrogen and the two the 2p um, z orbital eventually if we define z as our molecular axis um, to get to do our to get our bond to get our molecular orbital diagram for tom polyatomic molecules you can imagine we're going to need to take linear combinations of atomic orbitals across the whole molecular system and this is going to rapidly get um, quite complicated especially if we've got large molecules so the basic answer for this is to use a computer. So you can do use the Gaussian software, which you used um, in the second year Physchem labs last year, um, to do calculations. And if you do these calculations, these quantum mechanical calculations, you can get, for example, the orbitals. So here we have one of the molecular orbitals of a um, of a dye molecule. Um, here we have one of the molecular orbitals of um, alpha pinene. Um, so a molecule you'll have come across in the um, atmospheric course last year. So we can see, for example, in this molecule here, um, the, the molecular orbital is delocalized across the molecule, whereas in alpha pinene, um, the, the, the orbital we've got here is, is very localized on one part of the, the molecule. So you can do calculations and, and get this information. That brings me to the end of this lecture. Um, because time's fairly tight, there's no homework or pre-classroom pre task associated with this lecture, all I want you to do is come along to the timetable session ready to put what we've covered today into practice. So that brings me to the end of this lecture.